Perhaps the greatest debate in sustainability centers on whether there are limits to growth. Is it possible to achieve sustainability while continuously growing the economy, or is there a fundamental trade-off between these two objectives? Ever since the publication of the book The Limits to Growth in the 1970s, this issue has been fiercely debated. In this lecture, I explore the arguments both for and against the continued pursuit of economic growth in wealthy nations. So first of all, what is economic growth? Simply put, it's an increase in the production and consumption of goods and services. And this can occur when either population or the amount that each of us consumes increases. We typically measure growth using GDP, gross domestic product, which is the total expenditure on all new goods and services produced within a country over the course of a year. Economic growth is a relatively recent policy goal. These data span over 2,000 years. As you can see, for the vast majority of human history, the global population and the amount that each of us consumed remained relatively stable. This only really began to change in the 1800s, following the Industrial Revolution, and the majority of growth has occurred during the last century. Between 1900 and 2018, global population increased by a factor of five, from 1.5 to 7.5 billion people. At the same time, GDP per person grew by a factor of seven, from around $2,000 per person to over $15,000 per person. Five times as many people consuming, on average, seven times as much stuff. The result is a world economy that is almost 35 times the size that it was a little more than a century ago. This is a massive increase in the scale of the human enterprise. We might ask ourselves, can this really continue? Should it continue? There are two broad responses. The first response, put forward by organizations like the OECD and the United Nations Environment Program, is that we need economic growth, but we also need to make it greener. I call this the pro-growth or green growth view. The second response, put forward by ecological economists and many activists, is that we need to move beyond growth to achieve sustainability. And this includes ideas like a steady state economy, degrowth, and prosperity without growth. I call this the post-growth view. Let's look at each of these perspectives. The pro-growth view argues that growth is necessary for economic stability and the creation of jobs. Over time, improvements in technology tend to allow fewer people to do the same amount of work. So to keep people employed, production, and hence consumption, have to increase. More money also equals a higher standard of living, and who doesn't want to be richer, right? Although most neoclassical economists will admit that GDP is not really an indicator of quality of life, they'll argue that it's highly correlated. We also have the argument that economic growth is needed to reduce poverty, and not just economic growth in poor countries, but global economic growth. We need to grow our economies in wealthy countries like the UK to buy the products produced in poorer countries. The idea is that a rising tide lifts all boats. Global growth also avoids the tricky issue of redistribution, which is seen as politically unfeasible because it isn't easy to take money away from rich people. A further argument is that environmental policy can actually be a driver of growth. Actions like a green stimulus, the correction of market failures, and new technologies that are encouraged by higher environmental standards could all lead to higher growth. With the right modifications and incentives, the market will work towards a green economy. And finally, there is the environmental Kuznets curve hypothesis, which was first popularized by the World Bank in their 1992 World Development Report. The idea is that at low levels of income, people are unable to focus on environmental protection because they have to dedicate all of their income to meeting basic needs. However, people's environmental impact is low because their resource consumption is low. As income increases, so does the consumption of resources and with it environmental degradation. Eventually, however, a turning point is reached where people have sufficient income to meet their basic needs. Environmental protection then becomes a priority, and as income increases further, environmental degradation decreases. 
A central plank in the pro-growth argument is the idea of decoupling. That through technological progress or the shift to a service-based economy, we can break the link between economic activity and its environmental impacts. There are two types of decoupling that are often mentioned. With relative decoupling, both GDP and resource use grow over time, but GDP grows faster than resource use. This means that the economy is becoming more resource efficient, but the improvement in efficiency is not enough to counteract growth. This differs from absolute decoupling, which is what we really want, where resource use falls as GDP increases. It's really worth looking at the evidence for decoupling. If we look at material extraction data for both Europe and the UK, we can see some evidence that decoupling is occurring. GDP increased while total material extraction, that's all of the minerals, biomass, and fossil fuels extracted in each of these areas, remained relatively flat in Europe and actually declined in the UK. So on the surface, it looks like Europe is achieving relative decoupling and the UK is achieving absolute decoupling. If this is true, then great. We've solved the environmental crisis. I can stop the video right here. However, there's a trick. The data that I'm showing you don't take trade into account. The materials used to produce my mobile phone, which I'm using to create this video, don't just come from the UK. They come from countries all over the world. More and more, we are offshoring our environmental impacts to other nations. If we take trade into account and measure our material consumption, the evidence for decoupling disappears. Material consumption has actually increased faster than GDP in Europe, and at a similar rate to GDP in the UK. The big drop in material consumption that you can see in the UK around 2008-2009 was a result of the global financial crisis, not new technologies, unfortunately. And globally, the picture does not look good for decoupling. If anything, we have anti-decoupling. Resource use has increased faster than GDP in recent years. So why is decoupling so difficult? One reason is something called the rebound effect. This was first described by William Stanley Jevons in his 1865 book, The Coal Question. The basic idea is that new technologies that reduce resource use also tend to reduce costs. This frees up money that can then be spent on additional consumption, undermining the efficiency gains. Improvements in automobile efficiency provide a good example. As cars have become more efficient, they have consumed less fuel per mile traveled and the cost of driving has fallen. But the drivers of more efficient cars may use these savings to simply drive more miles, an example of direct rebound. Alternatively, they might spend this money on a different activity altogether, such as a holiday in Spain, increasing overall fuel use, which is an example of indirect rebound. Either way, because of the rebound effect, material and energy savings predicted on paper often fail to materialize in the real world. So that's the pro-growth perspective in a nutshell. Let's move on to the post-growth view. The post-growth view argues that while new technologies and the correction of market failures are important, they are not enough on their own. Wider systemic change is needed, and there are three basic reasons. The first is environmental. It comes from the fundamental idea of ecological economics, that the economy is a subsystem of the environment. All of the inputs to the economy come from the environment, and all of the wastes produced by it return to the environment. As the economy grows, we have to shovel in more resources and discharge more wastes. But since we live on a finite planet with limited resources, it's not possible for the economy to grow forever. The difficulty of decoupling, alongside the fact that humanity is already transgressing four planetary boundaries, suggests we need to tackle the scale of economic activity if we want to live within planetary limits. So that's the first reason. The second reason is social. Data are now widely available from surveys of happiness and life satisfaction. And if we look at these data over time for countries like the US or UK, we find that although GDP per person has more than tripled since 1950, people have not become any happier. 
This led the Canadian economist Peter Victor to remark that Americans have been more successful decoupling GDP from happiness than in decoupling it from material and energy. Clearly not what we want. One of the reasons for this is that GDP is a poor measure of progress which does not distinguish between good and bad economic activity. It's simply a measure of money changing hands. So if I go see a movie, this adds to GDP. If I buy a new bicycle, this also adds to GDP. If the government invests in education, this adds to GDP. Most people would consider these to be good things. However, if there is an oil spill that the government has to pay to clean up, that also adds to GDP. If more people start smoking, this adds to GDP twice. First when the cigarettes are sold, and second when healthcare costs go up. War, crime, and environmental destruction all contribute to GDP. And yet, at the same time, valuable activities like household and volunteer work are not counted towards GDP because no money changes hands. One of the arguments I mentioned earlier in favor of growth is that a rising tide lifts all boats. By growing the global economy, we can alleviate poverty. The World Bank defines the international poverty line as $1.90 a day. However, many researchers argue that $1.90 a day is not enough to survive on, and that a more realistic, empirical poverty line is $7.40 a day, as that's what's required to achieve a normal human life expectancy. In an article published in the World Economic Review, David Woodward demonstrated that it would take an extremely long time to eradicate poverty at either of these two lines if we were simply to rely on global economic growth. He calculated it would take over a hundred years to eradicate poverty below the 190 a day line and 200 years to eradicate it below the 740 a day line. Relying on global growth to reduce poverty is extremely inefficient because most of the growth in income goes to the richest people. Between 1999 and 2008, the poorest 60% of the world population received only 5% of the additional income generated by global growth in GDP. The World Bank cites economic growth as the essential ingredient for sustained poverty eradication. However, despite the fact that the global economy more than doubled in size between 1980 in 2015, the number of people living below the 740 a day line actually increased from 3.2 billion people in 1980 to 4.2 billion people in 2015. The third and final reason we might question growth is largely practical. Growth rates have been declining in many wealthy nations. Here are the data for France which show that average growth rates have fallen pretty consistently in each decade since the 1960s. These data only go up to 2019, so they also don't capture the effect of the coronavirus crisis, which has led to a dramatic decrease in economic activity. Countries are being forced to deal with low rates of economic growth, whether they planned for it or not. The ecological economist Tim Jackson has estimated that if current trends continue, within a decade, there will be no growth at all in GDP per capita across wealthy nations. Facebook and mobile phones are not having the same kind of transformative effect on our lives and the economy as inventions like electricity, the automobile, or indoor plumbing. This phenomenon has even led a number of mainstream economists to question whether growth can continue. So, to sum up, the pro-growth view argues that growth is necessary for both economic stability and the creation of jobs, that environmental problems can be solved by correcting market failures, and that it's possible to decouple economic growth from its environmental impacts. The post-growth view argues that decoupling is not so easy, and planetary boundaries therefore represent a real constraint on economic growth. It also argues that the social benefits of increasing GDP are not all they're cracked up to be. And since growth rates are declining in wealthy nations anyways, a post-growth economy may be inevitable.